so many people here um, this afternoon and hopefully we can all learn together and um, provide input and leave um, this afternoon knowing a little bit more than when we started. Um, I wanted to provide a little bit of, do I have to, there we go, just a brief history of Title 18. And first up, that what I want to express is that um, how, many, how many people in this room have been actively working on the Mayor's Quality Task Force groups? So there's quite a few people in this room that have been over several months working on the Mayor's Quality Task Force, um, looking at housing quality issues, homelessness, um, improvements. They've been very dedicated to this whole process. And part of where Title 18 came from is that Council Member Waldorf, Waldorf and myself were part of some of those meetings. And when we talked about um, home ownership and rentals and tenants, we started kind of going through this whole process of recognizing we have an issue with available housing for low income um, renters. And it's, it's changing, but it's not fast enough. Um, and what can we do to um, try and pave the way to get people moving forward into permanent safe housing or apartments. So that's kind of, we were working on the, um, the task force. And at the same time, um, Brian McClatchy, who is our legal advisor for the city council, as we were going through the um, city municipal code, looking at um, all, of the uh, all of the definitions and all of the um, inferences to discrimination in the code. And our code is huge, and it's every chapter. Had, a, had discrimination sections. So what he was doing was putting everything together in one chapter so if we had a citizen, we were being efficient. If we had a citizen that had a question about discrimination in employment, um, housing, um, disabilities, that there would be one chapter that they could go to and it's Title 18 now. So all of those are um, included in one chapter, all of those segments. So I did want to clarify that we did not do this just to make landlords mad. I promise you that. This was something that kind of grew as we were talking and what we could do to be fair and to help, you know, pave a way forward to get people in housing. So we did create it to organize the city code, putting all the human rights related policies in one place. Um, and Brian McClatchy did so much work on that whole um, Title 18. We couldn't, couldn't have done it without him. And he put up with a lot from us, too. Um, in that, we updated policies, including bias-free policing. Um, that had not been updated for some time. Um, and protections for people with disability and the homeless. We also updated protections from surveillance equipment, which meant a great deal to, um, we had to talk uh, with the Downtown Spokane Partnership, because they're going to have some surveillance equipment downtown. So it was important for us to connect with them to make sure that um, we had it written in such a way that they weren't going to be, um, they wouldn't have people filing public records requests and looking for, for um, their, their tapes from their equipment. So there were a lot of partners that uh, played a role in this. And we also looked at um, uh, updated areas addressing discrimination in employment and practices. Um, Okay, why are we talking about this? Well, the first reason we're talking about this, number one, again, as I explained, was the, um, the work, all the work that's been done on the quality, the Mayor's Quality Housing Task Force. Um, the other reason we're talking about it is, I know myself and others, I just on my own kind of started when I would run into people, especially at the grocery store in the parking lot, and we've all seen that family in that car or that truck with their belongings in it and they're parked in a Safeway parking lot. So what I started doing was just going up and asking first if they needed anything, if I could help, especially if they had children. And there were a few times when I would say, do you have a place to go? And they would say, no, we're looking for an apartment, but we can't get anything because they don't take vouchers. I have a housing voucher and they don't take vouchers. So that kind of started the ball rolling as far as what can we do to educate um, people so that those that have vouchers 
and have um, the wherewithal to get into apartment, at least have the opportunity to knock on a, on a door and say, I'd like to see your apartment, will you talk to me? So um, that's where this, this whole feeling came from, is how do we do that without um, hurting landlords? And how do we do that without hurting but helping the good tenants that um, are willing to do the work and um, can come forward and rent an apartment? So and we also had talked a lot about that um, vouchers really are good at bringing lower income families into um, middle class neighborhoods. So we don't ever really want to see just one neighborhood where that's where they do vouchers. That's where the people with vouchers live. That was a, um, a thought that came up through this process. And, um, and we also know, I think all of us know that um, vouchers that provide um, housing, safe housing um, assistance help people succeed, it helps their children, um, they are more productive in school, and um, will give back to the community. So here's what the proposal does. We've heard, um, I've had a lot of comments, there's been a lot of um, discussion around it, so we're making it as simple as possible thanks to um, Kevin and um, Ed made us kind of say, okay, what does this mean, and can you say it in a way that, um, that everybody gets it, and so we, we don't misinterpret it wrong. So what this does is it bans discrimination against potential renters due solely to the use of housing vouchers. Uh, two or three weeks ago, I had a woman call who had a voucher and a service animal. And she had called and said she was looking for housing and could she use me for a reference? Because I knew her from the council meetings. And I said, absolutely. I think you're responsible. I've gotten to know you. You definitely have them call me. She called me back and she said, well, I went to an apartment and I didn't get it. And I thought, oh, that poor dog. They wouldn't accept the dog. And she said, no. The, the lady said, absolutely no vouchers. So again, that came up that she wasn't willing to rent to somebody with vouchers. So what this says, what, our, uh, what Title 18 says is that you can't put a sign up. We don't want you to put signs up, and we don't want you to open the door and say, if you have a voucher, go away. What we would like to see is um, those individuals with vouchers, if they can sit and meet the income requirements that you, uh, your lease requirements and the income requirements, that if you feel they could be successful in renting that apartment, that they have that opportunity to do that. If they come with a voucher and there are other sources of income and it, it doesn't make them successful and you know it looking on paper that they're not going to be able to do a year's lease or a six month lease, you don't have to rent to them. All we want to see is they have that opportunity to approach landlords with their paperwork, their vouchers, their other income and say, look at this and let's work together to see if maybe I can rent this apartment. Um, it creates a complaint-driven investigation process with an emphasis on mediation. And I have to say that we've been fielding some calls the last three months. Um, we haven't had a lot. Most of the calls that we've gotten have been um, housing quality issues. Um, I've gotten maybe two or three voucher issues. And what we've been able to do, because we're all working together now, is I pick up the phone and I call Ed, or I call um, Terry Anderson with the Tenants Union, or vice versa, and we find a way to plug people in to educate that landlord or to help that tenant. Um, yesterday we had a family of six that had to be removed from a home because it was unhealthy, and so we have a family of six and nowhere to live. I sent out an email within 24 hours I got a call back from Catholic Charities, who is now connecting with this family and finding them a place to live. So we're really trying to get to these before there's any kind of a complaint process. If somebody calls, and I think we're having a, a piece on the complaint the, um, process in a little bit, but right off at the, at the top of it, when somebody calls, we will get the information what the problem is, and, and um, the staff that take those calls will kind of look to see where does this go, and who can help us. And the best part is, um, thank you to the Landlord Association, is they, they will be providing some um, mitigation resources 
mediation resources so a landlord and a tenant could sit down. If that's not possible, I've had many occasions with Ed where I'll say, I just got a call about a voucher, and he'll say, you know, that landlord probably hasn't been educated on this or probably doesn't know this is out here. Let me call and talk to him. So um, we're not going into this at all with a big stick wanting to hit people. But what we are trying to do is that when we get that call, use that call as an opportunity to educate and to inform um, so that we can help more and more people know that um, the behaviors and the um, Title 18 as far as that discrimination piece with vouchers. Uh, we also are going to be forming a stakeholder group to monitor um, all of the complaints and look at what type of complaints we're getting um, and kind of uh, continue looking at this model and look at um, uh, things that we can do to, to correct or modify or improve. Um, so we will, um, that will be in effect soon. And we also have um, the CHHS department, they're at this table back here, a couple of them. Um, that stands for Community Housing and Human Services Department with the City of Spokane. That staff is going to be the staff that's going to monitor those complaints. And it's a perfect fit because they do so much work with our nonprofit community. They do a lot of work with the housing community. And um, in fact, when I have a problem, I always copy them because they'll call me and say, did you check with so-and-so? They might be able to help you. So that's why we've included them in this process. And I, so I think we've got, a, we've got a good team of folks coming together to work through this. This is what the proposal does not do. It doesn't dictate terms of your lease durations, rent amounts, deposits, et cetera. If you, are a six, if you have six month leases, you have a six month lease. If somebody comes to you and they have a three month voucher and they have additional income but they're not meeting the requirements that you know they need to be successful to live in the apartment, they're not gonna be able to do that. So, we're not asking anybody to change their leases or to change the time or the durations of their leases. It does not disturb that first in time aspect for applications. So if somebody comes to you first and they want to rent the place and they don't have a voucher, they have the money to do it, do it. I mean, it, and if somebody comes second and they have a voucher, that was a missed opportunity. But um, it, we're, we're not messing with that at all. Um, it doesn't mandate any particular income screening or verification process. I've learned through this process with the group is that um, a lot of folks do um, screenings. They do it, um, background screenings, um, other landlords, th those kinds of things. We're, we're not going to mess with that. We just ask that legal and verifiable income must be included. So when you look at their, their source of income other than the voucher, that all of the income that they're reporting um, is looked at for their um, total amount of, of rent that they have to be responsible for. Um, prohibit other checks on potential renters. So you can still check criminal background, credit checks, all of that can still be done. So. At our last meeting, we uh, sat with Ed and Kevin, and um, I have to go back one second. When we started this whole process, I had, when we started talking about the idea of landlords and tenants, and I, you know, we're going to bring them together and talk about what we can do on this level to just at least protect those people with vouchers that can afford to rent apartments. I had somebody say, you will never get the landlords and the tenants. You will never get the landlord association and the tenants union in the same room. It's not going to happen. And I have to tell you that um, it happened. Uh, it was difficult work sometimes. It was challenging conversations. It was uncomfortable at times talking about these issues, trying to see every side of the issue. But these people stepped up, and both groups, along with our nonprofit community, they have all been here. And at the last meeting, Ed said, you know, we're all in this together. We're, we all really want the same things. We don't want to see those people in cars, living in cars, in Safeway parking lots in our neighborhoods. We don't want to see that. Um, we want to be able to help where we can, but we also have to respect that your rental property is your business, and we respect that. 
We just want to make sure that if there are opportunities to house people, and it's the, the right income and the, and the vouchers there, that they get that opportunity to try and rent an apartment. So um, it's complicated, I said that, but we're all on the same team. And I think that um, in the future, what we have talked about, the one change we, ha we have made, um, Brian and I presented to the Board of Realtors last week, and there was some discomfort in um, the, the July 1st date. We had moved the date for um, investigation and the complaint pro process. We had it at July 1. Board of Realtors felt very strongly that there needed to be more um, education and we needed to get the word out to more and more folks on this. So we did change that date to September 1. That will allow our staff to create some more opportunities for education forums like this. I would love to see at least a couple more to get more people informed of what's going on. Um, and the other thing that has come out of these discussions, I don't know where it's going to go, um, we were, will be exploring options with a couple other entities um, about a, an organization that would be a free resources, possibly legal resources as well for landlords and tenants um, that they could access our, if there are problems um, on either side. So that, kind, that idea kind of came out of these discussions. Um, it would be a full service housing clinic to address tenant and landlord issues. We're also looking at other partnerships for funding, um, resources, and especially relocation assistance. We had some houses moved two years ago. We had to move 12 houses on Gardner and Boone. There was a development going in. We were able to save seven of them. They were historic. People should not have been living in those houses. So the landlord agreed to, the landowner agreed to move the houses. We, did, we had no idea what to do with the families living inside them. And thank God for SNAP. I called them and they helped us relocate every single family, every single person that got um, displaced. So we would like to in the future have some kind of funding available to do that. And I think that that is all that I have to report right now. I'm going to be around all day, so if you have questions, concerns, if you want to yell at me, I'm good to yell at. But um, I will be here, and I appreciate you all being here, and I hope you get as much as you can from these panel discussions, because these are great people, and these are the experts. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. So with that, Skyler Overs, Karen's LA, is going to introduce our <clears throat> Title 18 panelists, and we'll start that discussion. So, Skyler? He has him. I think we're good. All right. Hi everybody, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Skylar Oberst. As Ed said, I work for Council Member Karen Stratton. Um, and I'm here to help moderate the panel today. So we've got an amazing panel, as Karen said, of experts. So I'm looking forward to just diving right in. I'm going to keep the, the introductions very, very short. Uh, we've got Brian McClatchy here, um, who works for the Spokane City Council as a policy advisor. We've got Richard Rodarte, um, and he is the manager of property operations at Spokane Housing Ventures. We've got Marley Hoffendonor here, um, who's the ED for Northwest Fair Housing Alliance. Mary Funt, who is the director of the Gonzaga Health and Justice uh, Clinic. Uh, Robert Rowley and Eric Steeman on the end, um, who are here and are going to share some of their thoughts as well. So this is really wonderful. And I say we dive in really quickly. Um, so we'll start with you, Marley. Uh, put you on the hot seat. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how Title 18 uh, will uh, in, in forms of the work that uh, your organization uh, is doing here in the city of Spokane. Okay, sure. Is this, uh, can you hear me? No. Green light on. Hello? Sounds like, okay, there we go. I'm on. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm pleased to be here today. Um, Northwest Fair Housing Alliance is a nonprofit fair housing organization. And we primarily receive grants from HUD to work on housing discrimination issues, both education, advocacy, and investigation. 
Um, we also work with the Washington State Human Rights Commission, the Washington AG's office, and others on some of the state um, fair housing laws as well. So this would be one more fair housing law um, that would be added. I do want to emphasize that a lot of the protections that are in Title 18 already appear in the other fair housing laws. So some of these things are not new. So um, for example, religion, national origin, race, these are already protected classes under the law. These other laws were going to be you know, business as usual with respect to those protected classes. The new things, however, are going to be the source of income, the uh, alternative sources of income, the subsidies. That's new. That's new for us as well. Um, I can tell you right now that's not covered under our HUD grants. We don't get a lot of funding to go out and testing in that area. Um, I would anticipate, um, you know, we remain a resource. However, um, the Spokane Human Rights Commission would like to work with us. Um, we're happy to do education initiatives like this. We, we try and take advantage of as many education opportunities as possible to help people understand the rules of the road. Um, and so I think it'll probably be the same with this. Um, but uh, we could play an advocate role if somebody comes to us and believes that they've been denied um, housing because of having a voucher, in which case we would follow the process and refer them to the city and uh, file a complaint. Um, again, we, we would uh, stand ready for whatever assistance we can provide the Human Rights Commission. So the education seems to be this thing that we've up uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, Barry, do you want to share a little bit about uh, early team from your perspective and how we can move forward in, in educating people? Sure. Uh, so I'm Barry Funt. I work at the Gonzaga uh, Health and Justice Law Clinic. Uh, we work to improve collaboration between healthcare providers and legal providers to address health harming legal needs uh, and improve the uh, health of our community and reduce healthcare costs. Uh, one place where all of us get, uh, if you talk about Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs, food, water, and shelter, where do we get it? we get it in these homes. So not only are we talking about a business for landlords, we're also talking about the primary location where those of us who are lucky enough to have a home fulfill our basic needs. Uh, so uh, it's really amazing that there is very little self-enforcing regulation in this area. Basically, there are rights under the Washington Landlord Tenant Act, but there are no, uh, but in order to have those rights, you have to basically go to court. Uh, so a tenant needs to find an attorney. Uh, for low-income folks, uh, the ratio of low-income attorneys is about one to every 3,000 low-income folks. A study by the Supreme Court determined that over 70% of low-income uh, folks have uh, legal needs and unmet legal needs in Washington State. Uh, and so there just aren't places to get that representation. So the primary area where this uh, change will, uh, I think, cha potentially change the experience for tenants is it's a venue that they can go through that's not the superior court. Uh, they can go and make a complaint, uh, much like Marley referenced the Human Rights Commission process. There's a HUD process too. Those are very difficult to navigate, and uh, the outcome for tenants uh, is frequently not that great, frankly. Um, so that's the biggest, I think, the biggest change is finally, you know, how many regulations are there on our cars? And those get enforced all the time. But the regulations on our houses where we meet these fundamental needs, those don't get enforced at all unless you can get an attorney. So I think we're, this is a small step in the right direction. Maybe I'll jump down to the very end. Um, Eric, do you have any thoughts about that? Any thoughts about <laughs> moving forward together? <laughs> My name is Eric Stephen. I'm an attorney in Spokane. I represent landlords in there, all counties east of the Cascade Mountains in Washington and Idaho. Great deal of my portfolio of clients are affordable housing providers. Um, I'm very concerned about the ordinance. I'm very concerned about what's going on in the industry. And my concerns are for a number of reasons. I think the mediation dialogue that I'm hearing is very good. It's very refreshing. I'd like to see a lot of that. I'm very concerned where the mediation will be in two or three years and whether that sort of mindset for collaboration will continue to exist or whether that'll eviscerate over time. Uh, right now, there are a number of agencies that are policing 
these type of rules and tenant screening in particular. Uh, the state attorney general's office is suing landlords like crazy over source of income discrimination, even when there are no city ordinances. I've already handled a couple cases. Robert Rowley, the attorney next to me, is handling a case right now, source of income discrimin uh, discrimination case, where there is no uh, city ordinance supporting that. The state AG is doing it under the guise of a disparate impact and uh, a whole different analysis. The state attorney general's office is asking for $15,000 every time they're starting one of these suits, and they're insisting that the landlord sign what's called a consent decree, which is essentially like a judgment against them filed in the court as a, uh, to sort of the resolution of the case from the start to the beginning. So I have big problems about that. I think we have a housing crisis, and I agree that we have a housing crisis. I think we have a real housing crisis as it relates to single family residents. I think that the more burdens we put on landlords, the more landlords are gonna sell those homes that are now single family residents in the inventory for, for rentals. When those homes are purchased, they will no longer be rental properties. All the rental properties that I have, if they're on the market today, they are converted to single family owner occupied residents. They will not be purchased to be rental properties. It won't pencil out. There won't be a return on the investment. So I have a lot of concerns about this, guys. I think that it's a good idea. I, I'm a Democrat. I believe in people. <laughs> I believe in taxes. I believe in, in public support policies. But I'm very concerned about what's going on in the industry. I'm especially concerned as it relates to tenant screening. Most of you here probably don't know that HUD issued a guidance memo on April 4, 2016. It significantly impacted the landlord's ability to screen for criminal conviction. Uh, history and criminal history. Now we have a lot of curtails on, on the economic side of it. So I, I think landlords are really, really being put in a press here. And I have to tell you, when I do evictions for a single family, for a small mom and pop landlord, about half of them say they're done and they're selling the house. So those are those are my concerns about what's going on. Eric, do you share those concerns? Or, sorry, Robert. I always love following Eric. Eric's always got the strong opinions on Eric. <laughs> Eric and I have been in the court for many, many years. So just like we've been opposite of Eric for a number of years, too. So um, I've been a landlord, um, and my wife and I for a number of years. We're also, uh, uh, I have a fairly active uh, landlord tenant practice. Not as good as uh, Eric's. But I would have to uh, echo his opinion. I think it's more of a housing issue as opposed to, it's almost a, a, a problem looking for a solution. <laughs> You know that the, the issues are being addressed, and they may not be perfect. But what I, what in life is perfect? Um, I, I mean, the AG's office is actively going out and uh, uh, going after landlords, and all over the state of Washington, even where there's not regulations, they find that that's a disparate uh, impact argument. Uh, you get the uh, consent decree, and, and they're ranging anywhere from five to fifteen thousand dollars. And again, they're just going down the list. And so this was just a case: the landlord would just said no voucher, uh, no, v no VA voucher, and that was where she left it at. And the next thing she knows, she gets the uh, AG coming after. Um, you know, there are issues out there. There's good tenants and there's bad landlords. But at the end of the day, I, I tend to think that the, the I'm a free market guy, so politically, I'm probably on the other side of the earth. But I think the market will fix itself. Uh, these issues do go away, and that if you keep putting more burdens on uh, landlords, what you're doing is you're going to create more of an issue. That's why I like uh, why we don't have rent control in the state yet. I think uh, once we have rent control, then what it's going to do is it'll just make uh, the housing market that much more tighter. Then we're going to have more of an issue with housing. So again, uh, I think that the, there is an issue, but it is getting uh, policed. Um, as to the uh, mediation, um, the, the RCW 5918 has had a, a mediation section for a number of years, and, and I can't think of a single instance where uh, there's been anybody that's ever actually mediated a case. Can you ever imagine? Well, I've mediated a number of cases with voluntary. Yeah, but it's uh, typically voluntary, and, and again, it's pretty darn rare that you would actually see somebody do that. So again, it's, again, it sounds good, but at the end of the day, it's, it, it just it makes everybody feel good, but I don't think it's really going to fix the issue. Rob, I have a question for you. Based on the AG's action, is there a precedence in Washington State that allows them to pursue these decrees for not accepting vouchers? Yeah, well, I was talking to Eric about I'll let Eric address that. Marley shared with me a case from uh, Yonkers, New York, about 10, 12 years ago. Um, 
So there's some precedent across the country. I don't think there's a case in the state of Washington, but uh, as I tell all my clients, you don't want to be the case of first impression. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to pay a tremendous price to be in that show. And uh, I, I can't imagine, I, I'm always trying to keep my clients out of the Court of Appeals reports, not get them into there to you know, create the new law. I'd rather create the law of the legislative process. And the Supreme Court recently upheld disparate impact in housing cases, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, so it is a, a known and there's precedent uh, supporting it. Brian, you're a landlord and you also have a craft Do you have any thoughts? Okay. So thanks. Thanks everybody for coming and uh, thanks to all the panelists. I'm glad that we get some folks who are really experts and have a ton of experience in this field to help with the uh, with the problem. I guess I just have a few things right at the top to say um, about this. First, I think, although the devil's in the details, this is a pretty simple request to treat all sources of income as income. Um, so, as I said, as we, as we try to maneuver our way through this and figure out how to do it in practice, we're going to run into a lot of implementation issues, and we expect that. That's why we have forums like this, so we can learn from each other. Uh, the second thing is, I completely agree with Eric and Rob about the market um, implications of this too. This is not a silver bullet. This is not going to solve all of our problems. Uh, this is one aspect um, of uh, the housing situation that we have in Spokane, an increasingly unaffordable housing market. Um, and so this is just one tool we can use to help uh, get people housed. Um, I guess the third thing I'll say is that um, Throughout this process of developing the ordinance, we've tried very hard to try to be sensitive to smaller landlords, particularly. And what we what we find is um, that having a source of income um, um, ordinance is actually one uh, is actually a requirement for a landlord mitigation fund. So uh, I don't know that a lot of people maybe know about uh, a fund that's available to help repair property that is. Uh, damaged as a result of someone using a voucher who rented the property and then and the damaged the property, um, a landlord can't take advantage of that unless they're in a jurisdiction that has a social income uh, ordinance like this one. Um, we've also been trying to help smaller uh, landlords by going away from a more punitive approach and into a more, you know, let's sit down and talk about what the issues are in the mediation environment. I realize that's not common, but we've tried very hard to stay away from a punitive approach, both in our work with the administration to figure out how to actually implement the thing, uh, and when we're thinking about remedies. So again, I appreciate everybody being on the panel and everybody coming here today to listen to what these folks have to say. I think it's a really good opportunity. Richard, uh, Spokane Housing Ventures has been integrally involved in some of the issues that we're calling the housing crisis or the housing problems we're having here. Do you want to share any thoughts about your, uh, your organization and in relation to Title 18? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me here. My name is Richard Rodarte. I'm with Spokane Housing Venture. I'm the manager of property operations. We operate in nine counties in the state, so we're not just in Spokane. Um, we're seeing housing crisis or tight markets pretty much across the state, even in some rural areas, uh, especially up in Okanagan. A county because uh, of fires and so on and so forth uh, just high demands second homes that type of thing um, we're set up I mean we, we we're for, for a housing provider so that's our business is vouchers um, that's why we exist we, we, we fit a market niche um, and providing affordable housing working with the programs understanding the programs working with HUD um, we built in some safety features in our budgets and so on and so forth, realizing uh, that we're going to have some rent loss, we're going to have some loss due to evictions, damages, so on and so forth um, with voucher uh, tenants. Uh, they, are, they are a little more complicated to deal with, yes. Uh, there is more paperwork, there's a little more risk, I, I agree. Um, so education and really knowing how the, the vouchers work, um, some delays that can potentially happen through the application and recertification processes. You need to be informed of, there potentially could be some inspections of the property itself uh, from the voucher uh, who's over providing the voucher. So it is a little more arduous type of uh, ordeal. So I think you need to be very educated about uh, whatever voucher that is being presented in front of you to know what uh, is required of the landlord. Um, so those are probably the biggest issues that I see. Um, the thing that I see as a hazard, I kind of uh, echo what Eric is saying there, 
is if you turn off too many landlords to the voucher program, they will just get out of business. And they will just say, you know what, this is too much for me. This is my business, this is a second business. I'm not in it for this, I've lost too much, I'm out, I'm selling the house, inventory's gone. So that's the, that's the other risk I see happening is that uh, if landlords don't feel comfortable with it, if they're not fully on board, they potentially could take the unit offline. <clears throat> Are there any thoughts on following up on that for the panel? Um, does anybody want to address some of these concerns that happen? And I know we'll have a question and answer time very soon for the audience, but just to maybe have a, a couple more thoughts shared. Uh, one of my biggest concerns about the statute it talked about, uh, or the ordinance talks about uncertainty, and when it comes to uh, there are other jurisdictions that have passed these similar laws and there have been no landlords leaving the industry. It's a very successful place. Everybody needs a home. I'm a landlord. It's, uh, uh, so I think those concerns are somewhat overblown. Uh, but in uh, uh, Representative Riccelli sponsored a, a law similar to this at the state level that we're um, also on the board of the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. We're hoping it would pass this year. Um, and, and one significant area in which it differs from the ordinance is it spells out how income is calculated. And it, this is an area that's come up, uh, creates a significant loophole for landlords. They can just simul uh, simply say, there's a income, we, have, we, we require three times, in three times the rent and in income. And, and so we have that, it's non-discriminatory, it applies across the board. Well, they don't calculate the voucher as part of income. They just calculate income. So the, the way the portion in that statute reads, and also it's emulated in Vancouver's statute, is if a landlord requires that an applicant have a certain threshold level of income, any source of income in the form of a rent voucher or subsidy must be subtracted from the total of the monthly rent prior to calculating if the income criteria have been met. I think that is a, a, a something that's uh, very significant and lacking from the proposed language as far as calculating income. And also when it comes to, it was brought up about criminal issues, uh, that HUD did pass down some guidance there and we, uh, the statute basically says, I'm concerned that landlords will read the portion under section 1803.025a that says they can consider, still consider background or rental history. They can consider those factors, but they need to do it under the guidance that HUD provided or they're just exposing themselves to uh, future litigation. That's not what I want. I want housing to be available. I want things to be above board. And that language to me uh, sends landlords in the wrong direction. They can consider certain criminal activity, but that criminal activity needs to be related to housing in some way. It can't just be, you know, you had a, a, a conviction 25 years ago, so you aren't suitable for housing. There has to be a calculation made there. So I'm concerned about uh, that language. Um, and then again, I, I, this landlords bristle at any regulation of the industry typically because for so long this hasn't been regulated. Uh, the no significant changes in the Residential Landlord Tenant Act uh, have occurred since 1973-74. Um, so uh, the, the fact that this is gonna kinda go away, yes, there are market forces at work, but also, you know, I don't think, and I've had landlords try to express to me that renting out their garden shed that has no plumbing, no electricity for $300 is some form of charity. That's not charity. You're not helping anyone. Yeah, okay, but we don't do that. I mean, let's just be honest. You're, you're no. really, who you're, is that? That's ridiculous. I'm sorry if I'm offending some folks, but I can show you pictures, and if you go to uh, code enforcement with the city of Spokane, you'll see plenty of housing providers who have rented out substandard dwellings, and the law does allow for relocate, relocation assistance. Yeah, but, but this is just because, this is ridiculous. 
it is. I, I, yeah, it is. It is. Because what you're suggesting that all of us who have a business out here and rent properties that were that were renting out garden sheds and that and that and that since seventy four laws haven't changed, I get it. Okay, what, do we need modern laws? I mean is that I do understand that's your business. That's what you do. You're an attorney, you make laws, or you're you're from Gonzaga, and that's what you do. So that that would make you relevant to have new laws. Well, okay, but if we can't, so uh, I would I would more than willing to be unrelevant, and that's what this statute helps make me not relevant. It helps make the gentleman at the end of the table not relevant because it takes it out of the courts and moves it into a mediation process, which is where these things need to go. There's a lot of common sense. A house with no running water and open sewer in the basement, that's not a suitable dwelling. Some gentlemen might argue with me regarding that, but I think generally, you know, that's the case. Yeah, and I think I get the point that, that there are landlords out there. I, I, I'm reluctant to call them landlords because there are people that have property for them that or something I get that. And I think we all get that. But today, I think when you look at the landlords who are in this room, the majority of them are members of the society, and that they are trying to do the right thing, that's what it appears to me about this building. I wish there was a way that all industries have that very small percentage near the bottom, that it's very difficult to please and where to get them to pay. Right, and they're not going to be just me today, because they simply don't care. But I, mean, I, I see both sides of that, but the right of being able to move forward on all the facts that you can see what this ordinance is designed to do and take it there, so we'll be able to move forward. And there's more discussion we can do it. Anyway. I was just going to suggest a thank you, Ed, for being taking my job away from me. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 this is, this is good. I think it's important to have a very real uh, discussion about this. And uh, we're about five minutes out, so if you do have questions for the panel, there is a microphone right over here. I encourage you to line up and so we can capture that for the cameras. Um, I also, to Ed's point into what Karen had said earlier and what many of the panel would, I think, agree, is that there are a, a lot of amazing, actually the vast majority of landlords in the city of Spokane are amazing landlords. Just as a lot of the, the tenants here in the, the city of Spokane are amazing tenants. What we're trying to do here is come together to fix solutions that are Spokane-centric, that are Spokane solutions to Spokane problems. And so it's encouraging to hear that there's so many people here today that want to be a part of that conversation. So I invite you to do that. Again, the, the microphone is right over there in the, in the corner. Um, by Betty and by Ed. And um, if we could just jump right back in really quick, I do have a question um, for some of our attorneys here. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion here about Title 18 and the legal system. Uh, I'm wondering just for a mom and pop landlord, I, maybe that would be something that I at a young age would want to do um, to rent out uh, a space that I have. Do you have any, uh, in terms of Title 18, do you have any suggestions or thoughts uh, for people who would get into that. Well, obviously, joining the Landlord Association, <laughs> attending these type of seminars. So that's the thing is, if you're going to be involved in it, you treat it like a business. Mm -hmm. So. And Rob, that is, you are right on. And that's what, increasing pro professionalism in, in the industry. And I would say having a relationship with an attorney, if you're going into, if you, you're moving out of town and you think, well, I'm just going to rent out my house because you know, maybe the values are going to go up. It's a mistake. This is a business. You need to have capital, look at capitalization, those sorts of things to make repairs. And you need to have a relationship with an uh, experienced landlord, uh, landlord like the gentleman at the end of the table. I've looked at uh, <coughs> Mr. Stevens' website to get guidance on my own lease uh, because I'm on the other, usually on the other side of the table. So uh, that would be my advice. What I would suggest is that uh, everybody understand that you're you're required to have a written screening criteria under a statute 5918257 of the Landlord Tenant Act. So you're supposed to tell people in advance what's going to result in acceptance or denial or conditional acceptance of their application. You're also, and I expect your screening criteria is going to govern uh, rental history, credit collection history, and criminal conviction history. You have to be very smart in doing the screening criteria. You need to vet it. You need to use a professional screening agency to help you do the screening. If somebody is denied or conditionally accepted, the state law requires you, 
and the federal law requires you to send out what's called an adverse action notice. There are a lot of people in this industry that aren't even following existing laws. And if we don't follow the laws, we have more laws placed on top of us to regulate us because we're not following the laws that we already have. So uh, when you ask me, what does a young person need to know about getting into the landlord-tenant business? I think Robert and Barry are right on point. It's a business, treat it like a business, keep it at arm's length, be very serious about it. Educate, educate, educate. I applaud all of you for being here and educating yourselves and uh, you can't get enough education. So um, surround yourself with professionals and a good team of vendors, and, and if you're gonna be a landlord, that's what you need to do. So we have a question? Yes. I have two questions. The first is, uh, can you explain what the city envisions the process to be in terms of once a complaint is filed, for instance, through, you know, mediation is, but then what happens? Is some adjudicating body going to look at the complaints and are there penalties? And I guess just to alleviate some of the unknown. Right, right, so um, I think maybe as Karen mentioned, there's gonna be, um, as a result of forums like this and other feedback that we've gotten from a number of, um, of folks who've reached out to us, you know, Kevin and Ed and others, uh, there will be one more, um, amendment to this that will clarify that after the discussions that we've had with um, the administration. And, this, and the framework would be as very straightforward as we can make it. If a complaint comes in, there will be a third an outside uh, vendor, contractor that will do a factual investigation, interview both sides, figure out what's really going on, make a, um, a determination of the facts and whether on the face of this complaint it has stated a violation of the, of the SMC. And if that's the case, then there could be an opportunity for mediation to be able to figure out how to sort this out. Um, if the mediation doesn't work or if the parties don't want to mediate and there is a facial um, violation of the code, then the file goes over to the city prosecutor to determine whether to file a civil infraction uh, or not. So at, at a few stages, um, this thing can get knocked out either. It doesn't state facts that, that show that a complaint uh, violation has occurred or the city prosecutor looks at this and says, you know, um, I still have prosecutorial discretion as to whether I'm going to file uh, a civil uh, infraction in that situation. So that brings me to my second question, and that is, uh, as an attorney in the, in the community or the industry, I, I think often of being able to supply information to landlords and tenants, and I wondered if any of you have ever reached out to the state bar to relax some of the conflict of interest uh, provisions and so forth for being able to, um, in, in the establishment of attorney-client relationships. So in other words, lawyers have rules that don't allow them to sort of freely advise people on the law sometimes. And so I wondered if if that's ever come up or if, uh, because like you represent landlords, typically people, they're landlord attorneys or they're tenant attorneys. And it seems like even here that tends to be polarizing. And um, I don't know, I mean, it, you, are you always checking for comp Does anyone understand the question? Or? One great resource is uh, WashingtonLawHelp.org, and it, uh, it's generally uh, uh, targeted. It's maintained by Northwest Justice Project. It's mainly targeted to low-income folks, uh, not typically landlords. But for instance, there is a packet on that uh, website about uh, Vancouver's uh, ordinance. Uh, has information about navigating that process um, because frequently and again why I, I like this sort of ordinance is you know litigating these things it's not a good solution anybody who goes down to the unlawful detainer docket that occurs in Superior Court every morning Monday through Thursday sees how this current system works and it's very imperfect um, so there are self-help resources out there uh, for tenants and uh, again as a landlord I've referenced those too as a simple way and when you're a low income <laughs> when, you, when you're an attorney that advocates for tenants I've gotten myself in trouble you know telling my tenant what I've done that he could potentially sue me for uh, it's probably not a good way to run a business uh, but uh, it's good, a good place to send uh, folks to no, so they know the law, both landlords and tenants. Authority Dave Scott, uh, Goodwill Supportive Services for Veteran Families, Dean Salvio. Uh, Goodwill also, Robert Green for the Hand Voucher Program. And Shauna Sampson, Spokane Neighborhood Action Partners, commonly known as SNAP. 
And we have Kimberly McNeese, Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing for VASH vouchers. Terry Anderson, uh, Washington State Tenants Union. And Kay Morano, Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium. So thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it. So, so the question is, is if we get a voucher, what do we do with it, right? <laughs> and how do we work with that? So I think today, um, I would like to start with Dave Scott. And he's going to give us an um, abbreviated version of what Spokane Housing Authority called HUD vouchers look like, how they operate, and how we can submit them. So we'll start there and see where we go with discussion from there. So thank you, Dave. Thank you. So I, uh, I'm assuming that we could probably have a conversation for a few hours. Uh, so when he said abbreviated version, it's very interesting for me to do an abbreviated version of our Housing Trades Voucher Program. Uh, the Housing Choice Voucher Program is based on income. So it's 30% of income with a maximum of 40% of income in the rental assistance payment. So there's so many different things that we could talk about with the Housing Choice Voucher itself. Uh, we, we administer uh, 5,066 vouchers in six counties. So we're, we're working in a large area. We have head bash vouchers, we have Poplar vouchers, City home vouchers that we're right now targeting youth that are homeless youth. We have family unification vouchers. Um, they're, each voucher works the same way. And the, the biggest thing that I think, and, and I know we have a very limited amount of time. Hold that up a little bit. Would you oh, want to I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing about the voucher program that, that I would like to really actually put out is that it really is a relationship between three people. And, and the very important part of voucher is that, that relationship stays true. And so it's a voucher, it's, it's a relationship that is built between a landlord and a tenant, which is a normal business activity. The third party in that is the housing authority. I know there's been questions brought up about how contracts, there's questions brought up about how inspections works, how long does it take to get an inspection, how long does it take to actually get paid. There's, there's numerous different avenues that we could go down. And what I would like to offer to you is that I have some cards over here. And I know today's forum is a very short forum, but I would like to offer to any one of you and or anybody that you can be in contact with to at least give me the opportunity to train or at least come and visit with you. Because to explain the voucher program in its entirety, 40 minutes isn't enough. Because there will be three hours worth of questions behind that. So I am, I am absolutely all in on building relationships with landlords and or tenants <coughs> and explaining our program with no hidden anything. I don't want anybody to walk out of a room and not understand our voucher program in its entirety, all of its rules, all of its advantages, and the advantage to the people and the landlord, because when we really look at it, what we have to look at is that we are providing housing and that's what you guys do. That is an essential part of what we do every day, every single person. So what we're looking at in the housing authority is we're trying to figure that we're providing housing, health, community, education, and transportation, and food. <clears throat> so when we look at our voucher, trying to put that in a place that is not a high poverty area, to get a tenant into a position where they have an opportunity to grow, be part of the community, and work their way off the voucher program, that is really the design of the voucher program. Can you hear me? No. 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 How about this one? Yeah. That so, so they, um, for us, me particularly, that are uneducated about vouchers. So, um, when I have a successful applicant that's a voucher recipient, um, what should I expect to happen? in the first phase of that. How, how am I going to get the tenant signed up, the lease written, and registered with you so I know what to expect and when am I going to get my funds for that rent? So the, the tenant goes through a process and, they, and we have to verify all of their income, assets, all of the different parts of the requirement that HUD gives us. Once we qualify them for a voucher, we put them through a briefing. And the briefing is an explanation of how the voucher works and the rules and regulations behind the voucher. Now, I, I know that a lot of times when I've given briefings myself, typically what people hear, and, and this is kind of a normal process, is kind of snoopy talk. 
So if you guys all remember, some of you guys might remember this. Whenever we ever heard anybody talk to it would be like, long, long, long. So you'll see people that just have lost over eyes because you're explaining this program to them. And then as soon as they get to the point of, okay, here is your voucher, and this is what it's worth, all of a sudden people want to understand what it's about. So it's, it's a two-fold problem. There's a tenant can't explain it to a landlord. A tenant can't explain it to another tenant because they haven't paid enough attention to understand what they're getting. You know, people refer to the voucher as a golden ticket. And you know what? It can very well be that when it comes to a housing situation. So the process is once they get their voucher, they then get what we call a request for tenancy approval. And there's some packets on the table back here that have an example request for tenancy approval. They also have an example have a contract in them. So please pick one up and take a look at it. They sit down with the landlord. They negotiate the rent. They fill out the request for tenancy approval. They bring that back into us. We then make sure that, that works within their income limits and the payment standard. If it does, we schedule an inspection. Our goal is to always schedule an inspection within the first week, if at all possible. And my inspectors are very good about squeezing those inspections in so we can get those new units done. After the inspection passes, then the landlord signs a lease with the tenant. Once the lease is signed, then it comes back to the responsibility of the landlord. So to say how long does it take to get paid really depends on how long it takes us to get a lease and how long it takes us to sit down and sign a half contract and then to process that. Right now we are working in June currently processing the new leases out there. And our goal is to streamline our process to where we can pay somebody within 15 days. So if we get that, the next check run that we have, our goal is that we're paying landlords within that 15 day period Typically, depending on when it falls, it could be that it falls in to somebody doing it on the fifth or sixth, and it would be the end of the month. However, we always pay from the day the half contract started. So even if it is 15 or 20 days later, we will pay our portion from the day the half contract uh, commenced. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dave. So I think, uh, Kimberly, if you, would you explain the, the VASH, how the housing VASHers, how that differs from the HUD yeah. and what landlords could expect, please? So I'm Kimberly McNeese. I'm the HUD VASH coordinator at the VA. Um, and the way that our program differs from the normal HUD program is that we provide case management to veterans who are coming in for services. So a veteran comes in. If they're VA eligible, we'll submit their packet to Spokane Housing Authority. Once they've been approved for the voucher and received the briefing, our case managers are going to work with them to find a landlord in the community that um, has an apartment or a property that will work within the voucher. Once that happens and they secure the property, um, any veteran who is within our program is required to participate in case management for a full year. Um, what that means is that we're going into the home, we're working with the veteran to hopefully mitigate any of the risks that would be to your property or also any risk to them for not securing permanent and independent housing, which is, per, you know, obviously our goal is to keep these people housed. So we try to have um, ongoing relationships and communication with landlords, including having our veterans sign releases of information with landlords so that if there's a problem with a tenant in the property, you guys can contact the case manager. The case manager can be working with um, the tenant, so our veteran, to work on whatever that issue is, whether it's a communication issue or how do we be a good neighbor, how do I take care of an apartment, you know, all these kinds of things that might be barriers for a veteran maintaining stable and independent housing. So we're doing that for a year, um, which is mandatory, but we stay with our veterans for as long as it takes for them to be able to function independently um, and sustain that permanent housing. So we've been with veterans for up to seven years. Um, and so again, we want landlords to be communicating with us and we're communicating with landlords often when we have our veterans in their property, checking in with them, saying, hey, how's it going, any problems? And so we want to have that open communication and, and any, we openly ask you, please call us if there's an issue because you know, we want to have a good relationship. We want you guys to continue to rent to our veterans so that we can house them in the community. Um, so that's really what we're doing. We're also looking to help them connect to mental health services. We're looking to help them gain employment in our office at homeless um, veterans. We offer employment services as well as therapy. 
And then of course we have the VA Medical Center where we're able to connect them to all the other services they may need, which might include substance abuse treatment and things like that. Again, risk factors, but again, we're always working to mitigate those so that they can be successfully housed. Great, thank you very much. So, the uh, Goodwill uh, offers two different vouchers, SSVF and um, where did I get the second one at? Supportive services. So, uh, do, you, do you want to talk about that one? And Bob, you could jump in and. Certainly. Uh, is that too loud? Okay. Uh, well, actually, we're, we are not a voucher program, a voucher program at Supportive Service for Veterans Family. Um, although we do just about everything that Kim does with the VA, but we're a short term program. So, we service low-income and extremely low-income uh, veterans and their families. If they are stuck, let's say, in a situation where they need to get the rent paid and they're going to be at intimate risk of homelessness, we'll help them to prevent that. Or if they're experiencing homelessness, we will actually, just like the VA does, it's a VA program. Um, we have three grants that we wrap around our folks to make sure that they can sustain their housing. Um, it's a usually about a three to six month program where we reach out and we pay any arrears they have, we pay uh, their rent for them, we pay their utilities. Um, we'll wrap around ser services once we ask them to house and we'll ensure that they can stabilize their housing and, and work on their barriers that they have. So we're, we're working with a, quite a few landlords in here and quite a few of the folks at this table to make sure that uh, we can sustain their housing. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Bob. Thanks, Stephen. Everybody hear me okay? Uh, my name is Bob Green. I'm the program manager for the Housing and Essential Needs Program, otherwise known as HEN, and just recently the reentry initiative through the county. <coughs> so I'll be uh, the program manager for both of those. Uh, HEN is not a voucher program either. Um, HEN is a direct pay program. Our participants are referred to us by DSHS, where they are screened for their low income, little or no income, and a uh, temporary disability. And so that temporary disability is what makes it a little bit tricky for us because people could have that temporary disability for two or three months, or they could have it for two or three years. So um, when we do intake with people, we're immediately looking to get them income. They come in with low income, we try to help find them jobs, and we try to help them get their social security. So it is a program when they're coming to landlords, they will have no income, but we will be paying their rent. And um, how we pay the rent is right out of our Spokane office. As soon as we receive the landlord packets and the lease and the paperwork, a check goes out within 24 hours. So it's a, a very quick turnover as far as payment goes. Um, same with the move-ins. We can usually get people moved in very quickly uh, because most of these people, if not all of them, are absolutely homeless. So they're needing a place to live as soon as possible. Um, Mr. Green, how yes. long do your rent supports go, go on? You're famous for a two-month... Uh, well, that's what's, that's what's tricky about the program. DSHS actually determines when their disability is either done and they're better or they've become permanently disabled and should be moving towards Social Security. So that's why with that first meeting we have with them, we start tracking towards increasing their income. So we don't get surprised by DSSHS changing their eligibility. The problem is, how would you support a tenant if you have a six month, if the landlord has a six month lease, or even month to month, how is the uh, two month uh, support gonna work? Well, it's not a two-month support. Uh, DSHS originally qualifies them for 12 months initially, but they can change that. And so that's, that's the slippery part of the program for us because we just don't know when their doctor is going to determine that their eligibility has changed. So we have people that have been on for four years, and we do have people that have been on for two months. And so that's why we try to work closely with the landlords and maybe go month to month with folks, or if someone just ends and leaves, we try to work with the landlord to provide another person to put into that spot. So that's, that's some of the pieces that we can do to support this program too. So, and as you all know, uh, not all tenants uh, work within the rules or communicate all the best they can, but 
Um, we try to work through those things with the landlord if we can and have a solution if the, the worst happens. So um, we depend on the landlords a lot to communicate with us. What's that? Would it be a violation of Title 18 if a landlord said no to a two-month support plan? Maybe I could rephrase that question if that's okay with you, Keith. So in the Title 18, there, there is language that says we must consider or look at short and long-term vouchers. For a lot of property owners, landlords, property managers, the question that continually is coming back up, so if, if we have a year's lease perhaps on all of our properties and we want to help you, but if you come with us with a voucher program that says we're good for six months, we think, or three months, we think, or two months, we think. Um, Brian could clear this up, we could talk about it later, but there's a lot of apprehension that they will be required to rent to that person if they meet the rest of their criteria, uh, regardless of short or long-term periods. And I think the way that I read that is, is we have the opportunity to put it within our rental criteria. Um, Brian could correct me about that later. But how does that work and what would you do if you came to me as a landlord and said, hey Ed, I've got this tenant, he's a great guy, I've got a voucher program for him that's good for six months. And I said, well, I need a year. Right, right, I completely understand. I, the challenge is, and, and the apprehension, I completely understand. I've dealt with it many, many times. Uh, we're not the ones that determine when their funding will end, and so we don't know. So that's why we want to be truthful with landlords up front and tell them this is, this is a program that could end. Uh, it could end quite swiftly. We normally do have the ability to, once we find out they've been take, their eligibility has been taken away, we still have two more months usually that we can pay in that buffer period. So very, very rarely does it come up that we're going to call a landlord with two weeks to go until the end of the month and say this person can't be paid next month. So um, I can't say this never happened. But usually we have a buffer in there that we can coordinate with the landlord and uh, like I say, either move that person out, move someone in, or um, do what we can. So is it fair to assume that if that was the case, Bob, that if, um, say we did a six months lease and four months into it, you knew that the funding was gonna end, like in, uh, the landlord was on a month to month basis, you'd give us a 20 day notice <clears throat> and we would go on with life and re-rent the unit in that process. Absolutely. Um, yes, we, do have, we realize the, the valuable resource that all of our landlords are. Communicating with them and letting them know any irregularities in this is, is vital to the whole piece. And so uh, that's where communication with the tenants and communication with the landlords is so important in this process because we, we do not want to burn any bridges with landlords, absolutely. There are, um, there are questions sometimes about what if someone trashes my property? Um, it was mentioned earlier, there are some funds available to help with that. So um, we do everything we can to eliminate the negativity. Um, but as you know, with some tenants, sometimes they just are, are challenging to work with. There's an inherent risk in our business, there is. Yeah, but but speaking, true, so. speaking of those funds, it's a mitigation, a landlord mitigation program. And actually, we recently were approved by the city, uh, or the city was approved via its Title 18 with the Department of Commerce to have those funds available to landlords. And Kay, I think you can speak with that today and give us an overview of that program. I can. <laughs> Uh, in 2016, the state legislation uh, was approved a program designed to provide financial assistance to landlords who rent to tenants using housing choice vouchers to pay their rent. Uh, if those tenants cause damage, the landlord can be reimbursed for the damages up to $5,000 per tenancy. In order to be eligible for that program, you have to have the unit be in the jurisdiction that has passed some sort of source of discrimination or source of income discrimination policy. Uh, statewide, we have not yet passed that in any way, shape, or form. Many different jurisdictions around the state have chosen to do that, mostly along the I-5 corridor. But we found out yesterday, thank you, Skyler, for your research and, and constant digging, 
that um, the Department of Commerce has looked at Title 18 and said that yes, Spokane will be eligible. Landlords whose properties are within the city would qualify for that funding. Um, hopefully, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> hopefully the county will follow suit for your properties that are not within the city limits, but we'll see what happens in that regards. Um, and the reimbursement is allowed to cover property damage, unpaid rent, and other damages caused as a result of the voucher holder's tenant occupancy. Uh, it must exceed normal wear and tear on the property and be in excess of $500, but not more than $5,000 per tenancy. Uh, so hopefully, as we have said, some of these tenants are at higher risk. And I know that one of the fears of saying, you know, I, I don't want to rent to people on a voucher or I'm concerned about what these tenants might do, uh, this can give a little bit of alleviation of that concern because you do have another possibility that those are not funds that you will have to come up with on your own or, you know, say, how many years does it take me to repay what I just needed to do? Yes? Am I correct in uh, saying that the the funding for that, for the statewide, is $125,000, the budget for that program? I haven't heard the overall total, so I don't know. It, that's correct. It's $125,000 for the whole state of Washington. And to qualify, a landlord has to have a successful judgment against that tenant. So Actually, a landlord I can tell you this about the program. Since it's been in existence, it's never run out of money. Do you know how many people have taken up that program? I do not. I know if some have applied. This. One other thing I think is important to know is that the, the funds are only available for HUD vouchers. I think it's very important to make that clear. Excuse me, one more point. A landlord has to sue that tenant and get a successful judgment against someone with no assets or attachable income, very likely, in order to be eligible for that up to $5,000. Correct. There has to be some sort of judgment against the tenant. That is correct. It could be done in small claims court, um, which someone was telling me today is, is actually pretty reasonable in price compared to many other court type situations. Uh, but you are correct that you do have to have a judgment against the tenant. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kay, but there has to be a judgment and you have to have completed the repairs before you can file for the abatement. Could, um, Terry Anderson recently commented, I believe, she was very surprised that no one had taken advantage of this program in Seattle, despite this uh, ordinance being in place for some time in Seattle. Could you elaborate on that? It's actually been in place just for one year because the legislation was passed in 2016. So they were just completing the 2017 legislative action. Um, I am also somewhat surprised that they haven't actually uh, had that take place, but I couldn't say as to why that is. I don't think it was all of those claims. Somebody else had a question too, though. Yes. The other problem facing landlord, landlords is the fact that there are free attorneys for people on low income, and me, I have to go hire an attorney to bring a lawsuit and avoid a judgment to get my money. And so we're at an extreme disadvantage. You know, yeah, if you guys want to ask a question, um, we have about two minutes left, then we're going to go to break, and then we're going to open it back up for question and answers, but we need to get you up here so we can get it on film, if that's okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ask the question for you when we get to that, okay? Fair enough? to get that done. So um, as far as vouchers go, abatement programs, is there anything else that any of the panelists would like to add? I know um, we haven't got the snap yet. And uh, Shana, do you have anything you'd like to add in the closing moments? In, in terms of abatement um, or risk that landlords take when they um, house our clients, and I have to add that. So I'm the head of the Homeless Services Department at SNAP. and. Like the Goodwill programs, we don't have vouchers per se. We provide rental assistance to clients, and there's no set time period that we provide services. It's based on that individual's needs. However, we can start with a six-month lease and then move up from there. And we do have some funding available after a client exits if we do need to go in and help with some mediation um, services or if, if troubles arise late, later. 
Um, but one of the tools that we do have at our disposal is that we can provide a double deposit when a client moves in so that at least there's that um, to kind of help lower the risk a little bit of damage you know, once a client moves out or if there's damage during their tenancy. And, and we have seen a lot of success with that. We've been able to, I think, house more individuals because we've been able to offer that as a tool to get people into housing. Great, thank you. And Terry, I wasn't ignoring you, I was just on the voucher program. So from your perspective, you've worked with a lot of tenants, so could you tell us about the positives that you've experienced with the voucher programs? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would also like to say that Spokane is not the first city in the state to be addressing um, source of income discrimination. Seattle, Vancouver, Renton, Tequila, Kent, and Auburn all have passed the same, the same ordinance, and Burien is voting on August 7th. So this is actually kind of sweeping the state right now, and we are not really seeing any um, loss of rental housing in any of those markets that as a result of the um, of the uh, uh, ordinances and then the gentleman asked a question of me about um, I had expressed so I, I wasn't expressing surprise that there hadn't been any funds dispersed in the, this program but that there's been no applications and I think the point I was making is that there's a lot of stereotypes there's a lot of generalizations that people make um, rightly or wrongly, I don't, you know, I mean, I, I, I you know, from our point of view that a general realizations that, you know, are, may not be based in reality, and, and I think the fact that nobody has applied for those fundings may indicate that there really isn't as much damage to rental property as people might think that there would be, um, because there is, well, there, there's the availability of those funds, and it, nobody has applied. Nobody knows about it. No one knows about it. That's, that's really what it will be. Well, Western Washington has a lot more population than we do, and, and I was just, I've just been told that, that West, there has not been any applications in Western Washington. What I think that this will, well now, that's why we're here, that's why we're doing forums. I think that that's the whole point of getting uh, Applications for the Landlord Mitigation Program. And Kay is an excellent resource, and she could provide more information than I know about that program, but that's why we want to be out in the community to educate people to know that there are resources available. I think that this will have a positive effect on landlord-tenant relationships because it will take away the initial fear and uncertainty that tenants feel. Many tenants who are uh, applying for vouchers, it could be as a result of a catastrophe, maybe a death in the family, maybe a significant um, handy, or disability or impairment. Um, it, it, many reasons that, that cause a person to actually be in a position to apply for, um, for uh, vouchers. We also think that, I mean, only 12 people out of 100 in Spokane that are eligible financially to get vouchers, only 12 actually receive them. And so that's a good thing. And we don't want to see that resource lost in our community and have even fewer uh, low-income folks get housing subsidies that are eligible for them. So I think it's going to improve the relationship because going in, a tenant isn't going to have that fear and uncertainty that they can really hurt a relationship once the tenancy happens. If the tenant is afraid, they're less likely to ask for a repair, they're less likely to report incidents that a landlord would want to know. A tenant may be too fearful to tell a landlord, even if it's something that isn't anything they should be afraid of. But a lot of that comes just from the initial encounter. When a tenant has had two or three repeated experiences where the sign on the door says you're not welcome, just by virtue of, of being a, 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 a recipient of a housing voucher, that can cause a person to feel like maybe I'm not wanted as a tenant. And so I think this is a good thing, and I think that it's a good thing also that landlords will now have a relationship with tenants that have vouchers, and you can learn also what we've always known, that tenants with vouchers value that housing resource, and because they value that housing resource, they do take care of their property, they want to have a good relationship with their landlord, and I think this just is going to foster that from the outset, so I think it's a good thing.